wish the athletes well. I do not encourage them to speak out against the Chinese government there because I fear for their safety if they do. That was House Speaker Nancy Pelosi urging U.S. Olympians to be safe and avoid controversial protests during the Winter Games in Beijing, which are officially underway. Chinese authorities have warned Olympians that any form of political protest could bring prosecution. Well, in other words, jail time. Here's the quote. Any behavior or speech that is against the Olympic spirit, especially against the Chinese laws and regulations, are also subject to certain punishment, end quote. That from a senior Beijing organizing committee official. Pelosi acknowledged the U.S. has a moral obligation to condemn China's human rights violations, but warned the Olympics were not the time or the place for athletes to voice their concerns. Joining us now to talk about this, Noah Hoffman, 2014 and 2018 Olympic cross-country skier. Noah, it's good to see you. What do you make of this warning? Yeah, I, I agree, unfortunately, with Speaker Pelosi because of, as you showed on there, the, the quote from the organizing committee uh, that represents the position of the Chinese Communist Party. But not only that, but because the International Olympic Committee has shown through their previous actions, mostly their actions regarding the disappeared tennis player Peng Shuai, mm -hmm. that they are going to side with the Chinese Communist Party when it's a, an athlete's well-being pitted against the interests of the Chinese state. And so if the organizing committee and the International Olympic Committee, the two entities responsible for protecting athletes, are going to are going to be the ones punishing athletes for speaking out, then what choice do athletes have? There's nobody else to protect them. So I unfortunately agree with Speaker Pelosi that these athletes uh, should keep themselves safe first and foremost. I'm trying to imagine what these athletes are thinking. I mean, you've been there. If you found yourself on the medal stand, and this is you've trained a long time for this, if you have a platform to make a statement ever, it's then. Do you guys talk about whether this is something you would, should, or could do and ultimately will do if you had the chance at these games. Look, when you're, when you're an elite athlete, you're traveling all over the world with people. You talk about absolutely everything because you're spending most of your life with these people. And mm. they're, of course, athletes who have really strong political views and honestly don't like the way that the games are being used to sport wash genocide like they are in China and want to stand up and say, I I'm, not a, I'm not okay with being used to legitimize the Chinese regime. Uh, and so I think that if you had athletes feeling like they were safe to say something, they would they would stand up and say, this is not a political statement. This is just standing up for decent human rights. Yeah. Safe is another interesting word you use, Noah, because, um, you know, they're talking about the possibility of, of athletes uh, espionage. Perhaps they're going to, you know, just assume that the Chinese government is watching everything they do. They're told not to bring their regular phones, bring a burner phone and not log on. Don't use any of your passwords. Did you get any of these warnings when you went to Sochi? No, this is this is so different from any of the previous games, certainly the two that I attended. And as you say, there were there were human rights issues in Sochi. There was a mm -hmm. uh, lack of, uh, you know, lack of, of political of civil rights in Sochi, but nothing like this, nothing like the the power that the Chinese state has to surveil people, to uh, to, to censor content. Uh, this is a whole different ballgame. When I heard that my teammates had to get rental computers and burner phones to go over there and and were told that they that they couldn't use their own devices and that they they should expect everything that they communicate while they're in China to be to be seen by the Chinese state. I was flabbergasted. That I, that is an unacceptable be breach of privacy and unacceptable for the International Olympic Committee to put athletes in this position. Wow, great insight from Olympic cross country skier Noah Hoffman. Noah, thanks for the time. We appreciate it. Thank you for having me. As the Olympics kick off in Beijing, its relations with Moscow have never been stronger. In a meeting today, Russian President Vladimir Putin and Chinese leader Xi Jinping stood side by side, pledging support, calling their, quote, friendship limitless, and noting that there are no forbidden areas of cooperation between the two countries, end quote. This is a strategic decision that has far-reaching influence on China, Russia, and the world, according to President Xi. The parties oppose the further expansion of NATO and call on the North Atlantic Alliance to abandon the ideological approaches of the Cold War. And again, according to a joint statement, retired Lieutenant Colonel Tony Schaefer was a senior military intelligence officer for the Army. He joins us now. Read between the lines for us, Colonel. What do you make out of that statement? Well, Joe, look, uh, both of these nations have long-term strategic objectives 
which may only be achieved through use of military force. So what they're signaling here essentially is their willingness to potentially kind of go it together to achieve some of these. I mean, we've talked about Ukraine a number of times. Right. Uh, that paranoia, Joe, just so you know, goes back to, you know, the 19th century. Tsar uh, Alexander III started pursuing uh, this kind of idea of buffer zones around the, the Russia Republic or Russia Empire back then before the Soviets came along. And Putin's been very clear on what he wants to achieve regarding reestablishing the Soviet Union. Uh, Xi, on the other hand, is, has said similar things relating to the, the, their interest in dominating the Pacific Rim, specifically Taiwan. So I think what they're trying to signal, based on the demonstrated weakness of the Biden administration through Afghanistan and other blunders, that uh, they're trying to signal that there may be uh, cooperation at all levels should they decide to act. And, it's, and this is what they're trying to signal through this very public display of friendship. Right. Let, let's talk a little bit more about Ukraine, Colonel. The, the Pentagon sure. is saying now that Russia is planning a false flag operation that involved the corpses and actors to justify an invasion. But I, I'm sorry, it, it, it's almost laughable. It sounds like I trust our intelligence. I really do. I'm not insulting you in any way. But this is starting nope. to sound it's start, start, starting to sound ridiculous. No, I'm with you. Look, uh, I've been on the inside and I understand how these things can get out of hand. I'm not going to accuse anybody in the Biden administration of wrongdoing. With that said, there's been several examples by past presidents, uh, JFK, the Cuban Missile Crisis presenting uh, via Adelaide Stevenson in front of the UN pictures uh, of missiles in Cuba. Uh, Pro President Reagan, uh, when the, the uh, Russians, the Soviets downed Korean Airlines Flight 007 in the Kamchatka area of, uh, of uh, near Japan, they presented clear and compelling direct evidence of the intelligence. Uh, I, frankly, at this point, I, I would call for the same thing. My sources are not confirming any of this. I have pretty good sources. Yeah. So at this point, I, I think there's reasons to be skeptical about this claim of a false flag. It just feels to me like it's taken so long. And, and I don't, I mean, maybe he's just trying to drum stuff up. But to me, and you know this as well as I do, Colonel, someone's going to punch you in the face. Chances are they're not going to tell you they're just going to do it. That's correct. And I think that's what we have to be aware of. And I'm not com completely convinced that Putin wants to go to war, but if he continues to see weakness and sees opportunity, he will. I, I don't believe at this point any of the Biden administration actions have been successful either on the diplomatic side of trying to get them to back down on their paranoia, nor have they shown a, a very clear military resolve. All the things they're doing, if they were serious, Joe, should have been started uh, six months ago, maybe eight, when uh, Russia went into Estonia, did an exercise and left their gear. It's like, hmm, maybe that's a hint. Yeah. So I I'm just saying that that there's a middle ground here that we need to be looking at, that I would be pursuing if I were, were uh, Secretary Blinken, trying to say, look, we're not trying to antagonize you, but there are consequences that, that should happen. <laughs> My concern right now, Joe, is miscalculation on both sides. Sure. Uh, many wars have started because of miscalculation. So right now, the, the signaling is so muddled, I'm almost afraid that someone's just going to miscalculate and something bad's going to happen based on uh, just not knowing what to do next. Right. And the fact that they have 100,000 troops on the border. I mean, correct. All right. Hey, listen, it's always good to get uh, the insight from retired Lieutenant Colonel Tony Schaefer, a friend of the program. Colonel, it's good to see you. you Take too. care. Good to see you, Joe. Five-year-old boy trapped more than 100 feet below ground. How the world is coming together to save him. That's tonight on News Nation Prime. 9 Eastern, 8 Central. Marnie will be there for that. Dramatic body cam video of the moment police shoot and kill a young man while executing a no-knock warrant. The man had a gun legally, but was not the person they were looking for. Coming up, the pastor who's spending 100 days on a roof in the Chicago winter will bring attention to gun violence and we'll talk with him as well. Does trust in the police need to come first? And the first ever black principal of a nearly all white high school in Texas forced to resign after sharing some of his feelings about race to his school community. He'll join us next. Moving on now to an educator from Texas, Dr. James Whitfield, the first black principal at the mostly white Colleyville Heritage High School in North Texas, is no longer working at the school. This all started back in 2020 when, upset over the deaths of George Floyd, Ahmaud Arbery, and Breonna Taylor, he wrote a letter 
to the school community, and in it, Dr. Whitfield declared systemic racism alive and well. well now he is the former principal at Colleyville Heritage High School. He was accused of teaching and promoting critical race theory. Dr. Whitfield joins us now live. Doctor, I've read a lot of stories on your, your plight here. It's, it's an honor to talk with you in person. I'd like to start, I guess, with the fact that the students rallied around you, but it wasn't enough. And now that you've had a little time to digest this, I'm sure you've been asked, but what did you do wrong? What do you tell people? Well, Joe, it is, it's great to be with you. Thanks for having me on. And like you said, it was, it was such an honor. You know, what I do as a school leader is for kids. They're, they're my why, they're my driver, my passion. And to see them step up and support me, and not only me, but their, their peers, right? Those kids were coming to the table to talk about their experiences and the people that they go to school with, their experiences as marginalized students in those uh, communities. And so it really meant a lot. And, it, and as far as, you know, what was wrong, you know, I think what we've seen across the country is we've seen people brand this critical race theory boogeyman uh, as anything that is related to diversity, equity, and inclusion. And of course, as a public school educator, those are things that are front and center as I try to create that environment with my colleagues to provide an, an, a school experience that speaks to those things each day. And so, you know, they've said the playbook is out. It's really, they know it's not critical race theory. It's anything related to uh, discussions of racism, discussions about diversity, equity, and inclusion. They're going to brand any of those things as CRT. So were they accusing you of teaching CRT, or did this all stem from the letter in 2020? And when you wrote that letter, did you have any idea it was going to lead to all this? That's a great question. So when I wrote the letter in 2020, that was on the heels of George Floyd being murdered in the streets of Minneapolis. And what I saw after that was people coming together in ways that I had never seen before. And I was, at the time, almost 42 years old. I had people coming to me and saying, hey, what can we do to learn? What can we do to grow? What can we do to stomp out racism? This was all music to my ears because I knew that these were things, as a, as a Black man in America, I knew that these were conversations that we needed to have. And to see people more open and welcome to those opportunities was very encouraging yeah. to me. But so, as time went on, people tried to, you know, uh, take that moment. And it's like any time in our, in our history, anytime there's a moment of progress, there's a backlash. And what we're seeing right now is, is that backlash. So there's a lot of debate, Doctor, over what CRT even is and what can and can't be taught or how it's taught. Here's what the podcaster Keisha King told us earlier this week. When you take black history and then you say today that simply by being white, you automatically are an oppressor or responsible for the history of uh, your, your white ancestors, that's a problem. Or if you are black and you automatically are deemed oppressed, that is a problem. That is not the majority of what black people are doing today. We are actually doing very well. I'll, uh, I'll let you tackle that to start, doctor, but I did have another quote after that about this I wanted to ask you about too. Yeah, for sure. And that is, that's the dog whistle, right? That we've heard time and time again, that this is about somehow making certain individuals feel bad about their ancestry or somehow making others feel oppressed because at one point they were enslaved people. That's not what teaching true and accurate history is. And I would dare say that not delving into these topics and addressing the systemic inequalities that have existed over time. This is not, you know, some made up thing. You know, when we're talking about critical race theory, which what they're talking about is not, um, it's about investigating those systemic inequalities that are inherent within systems in our right. country. And yes. Yeah, I mean, that, that's what it's all about in the, in the classroom is learning. And uh, I guess challenging your beliefs and learning more about where we've been and how it if it impacts, I guess, where we are now, which goes to this Mississippi law student I wanted to get you on as well, who identifies herself as conservative and says her CRT class was the most impactful class she's taken. There's more of what she says there. Why are they so fearful of people just theorizing and just thinking? That to me, doctor, is what the, the key is to all of this. What are people so afraid of? Yeah, I read Brittany's uh, piece and it was really, it, it, it 
confirmed like what we know to be true when people have an open mind and heart about things you know it just doesn't this is not an issue of whether you're conservative or or liberal there's there's information there and and it's it's important for us to investigate these things and her story particularly mm -hmm. you know it's just it's a confirmation that if we take the time to sit and listen uh and investigate you know with with facts you know the power of learning because only only when we we sit and learn about these issues and really have open honest dialogue can we ever grow right. and that's all anyone desires to do doctor i'm literally out of time but i just want to know will you be a principal again or are you done you know serving kids has been that's been my mission my purpose uh, I will never count anything out. Okay. Uh, right now, I'm just kind of taking that time for my family, you know, doing some um, some advising, consulting, and those things. But definitely, if an opportunity arises, that's the right opportunity. Uh, you you'll def you'll see me back serving All right. students. Dr. James Whitfield, educator. Thank you for joining us. We appreciate the time and the insight. Thank you. Thank you, Joe. Michael Albanati, remember him? convicted of more crimes, this time in the Stormy Daniels fraud case. Later, we're going to talk about how the country and the media couldn't get enough of them at one point. Remember that? Plus, the fast food chain that pays its employees 19 bucks an hour and offers a lot of great benefits. Coming up, how do they do that while charging five bucks for a burger? A booming jobs report just released this morning revealing the economy is on its way to a comeback. The U.S. added 467,000 jobs in January, and the unemployment rate did tick up a bit to 4%. But there are a number of catches to these numbers. As job numbers went up, so did prices. We're now paying significantly more for everyday things like your morning coffee, gas we put in our cars, Amazon, and even Netflix. And then there's this. A study from Johns Hopkins reveals the lockdowns that arguably brought us to this point in the economy weren't that effective, although critics say that came from economists and not the school's coronavirus center. Joining me now to talk more about this, two business owners, Chef Andrew Gruel, good to have him back, and Ian Smith as well, who fought back against lockdowns and kept his gym open in New Jersey. Chef, let's start with you. As we talked about this this morning, we just kind of asked the question, which we have in the past, is it time to move on? Get the shot or don't wear a mask or don't, but deal with the economy, which is, seems to be the main concern for people today. Yeah, it was time to move on two years ago, to be frank. And I think that the evidence coming out from that Johns Hopkins report really underscores that point. And when it comes to the numbers that are coming out, I don't want to get too granular with it, but let's be frank about these numbers, okay? If I close my business for an entire week and then a year later I open for that week, I can say that I've had an infinite amount of growth. And that's exactly what's happened with these numbers here with the economy. Um, this obviously is against a backdrop in which the price of goods, the price of labor, the price of everything is exponentially through the roof. And and the government, both local, state, and federal, has effectively strangled the entire restaurant, retail, and you know, gym industry. For my for my friend here, uh, who obviously has been one fighting back in in regards to that particular aspect. Ian, does it feel to you like things are back to normal? I'm not necessarily a good judge because I've been out in this thing since the jump because I've had to come into work. Um, but it does feel to me like, as I look around, everything is pretty much open again, short of offices who haven't brought their workers back in. But my question is. How different would it be from where we are right now than whether we said, okay, everything's back open again? Would that be a huge difference? You know, I think the huge difference is that there's been a tremendous amount of damage that has been done to small businesses. And now there's a, a tremendous amount of aftershock um, that small businesses are dealing with, things like supply chain issues, things like rising costs. All of, the, all of these are at least somewhat related to the lockdown approach. Um, it had a tremendous negative impact on the economy. Um, so you could open everything up um, and business would, would rebound. But the, I think the point is that government needs to take accountability for this huge, huge blow to small business. Um, I don't think it's acceptable for them to just say, oops, and um, 
act like this never happened. You know, uh, it, it, the people who champion these things should be held accountable for the damage that they brought to middle America. Chef, we talked about this Johns Hopkins uh, report, and I think part of it that did have an effect, according to that study, was closing bars, which is where a lot of people would gather indoors. I wonder where you are on what we've been doing about restaurants, because it seems like we all laugh at the fact that we have to wear a mask for the 30 seconds when we walk in and then take it off for an hour and a half while we eat. I mean, it's all absurd. It's performative theater at this point. We know it works and we know it doesn't work. And many of us have been saying what works from the very beginning, only to be called conspiracy theorists. And now everything that we said was right, but there's obviously no recourse. Uh, as Ian said, you know, there needs to be accountability held there. But I also think that we need to call out the fact that this has crushed the consumer psychology. And that's not something that you can change overnight with a press release. Right. Customers are scared and they're scared because people like Dr. Fauci are going out there saying, don't go eat at restaurants, don't go to bars. That's the last Thing that you should be doing and then every single health official is following that same refrain and customers are like what should I do so instead they utilize all these Silicon Valley third-party delivery apps which cost the restaurants 30 cents on every single dollar only further exacerbating their losses keeps them open it's a necessary evil and then the government's like look your sales are the same but when you had 2% margins and now you're negative 28% and you've got no money and no access to cash or capital you're screwed and that's where all the small businesses are going to continue to get wiped and they're going to get replaced by large multi-unit corporations that have effectively merged with the government. All right, Chef Andrew Gruel and Ian Smith, we need to move on, but we appreciate your time. Thanks, both of you. Well said. All right, we're going to talk now a little bit more about the mom and pop angle that the Chef Gruel mentioned there. Something that's working, a fast food restaurant in Seattle. Dick's Drive-In pays its workers $19 an hour and provides great benefits. The best part, they've managed to keep every item on their menu under $5. Joining me now, Dick's Drive-In president, Jasmine Donovan. Jasmine, thank you so much for the time. Other than Pike Place Market, uh, Dix is a must stop uh, in the Pacific Northwest. I spent a lot of time in Portland. Our question today, as we talked about your angle here, is how are you doing this? I mean, how are you paying people $19 an hour with a $5 burger? Well, we've been around now for 68 years. So my grandfather started the restaurant. Uh, in 1954 with two other partners. And then in the 90s, my family bought out those other two partners and it's a family owned business. And um, we have been dedicated to paying the highest wages and benefits in the industry for our entire history. Hmm. Um, a big part of why we do what we do is our employees. So it's been in our business model from the beginning. So um, uh, well, go there's, ahead. There's some other specifics there. Uh, that we could get into, but that's, I mean, that's at the core of it. We know why we do what we do, and, and so part of what we're doing is, is paying the best wages and benefits in the industry. Right. Another big name in Seattle, Dan Price, has talked a lot about this, and I know he's tweeted about what you're doing there in support of it. The folks we've had on, though, who struggle with it, though, Jasmine, say, I just can't afford to do it. It's the smaller mom and pop businesses who say they can't afford to do it. How do they do that? What can they learn from you? And we talk with businesses all the time that are earlier in their history and, and trying to figure out what they can do for their employees. Because I've never talked to an employer who reached out to us and say, hey, we want to do what you do that didn't care deeply about their employees and wanted to do the best for them that they could. Right. So some of the advantages we have is, again, we've been around a really long time. We do something very specific and we're very good at it. And uh, we developed that over time. We weren't that good at it at the beginning in that you know we were successful from the beginning but uh, we've honed our craft over time we also are in a different position than many restaurants because we own most of our real estate so mm. our original founders made some really good decisions early on that when they could they went back and bought the dirt under their restaurants and um, that means that we control our own destiny in a lot of different ways uh, we also are a low margin product, but high right. volume. So we are open from 10.30 a.m. to 2 a.m. and we serve customers that entire time. So our burgers are not um, expensive. We're, we try to stay the lowest uh, costs in the market for our customers, um, but we sell a lot of burgers. Yeah. So all of that together means that we have opportunities to invest in our employees. So. My grandfather had this business philosophy that still guides us today, and I, I share it with people who reach out to us, which is step one, a business has to make a profit, because a business that doesn't make a profit can't help anyone. Step two is to invest in your employees, because if your employees are happy and thriving, uh, they'll serve your customers better, you'll make better profit, sure. more profit, those customers will come back more times, 
your employees after they move on and do other things will be evangelists for your company. Yeah. Um, and then step three is to invest in the community, which we do too. Wow. So um, in every one of those is a virtuous cycle. And, and a new business or a small business, um, smaller than us, uh, maybe can't do all of it all at once, but you just uh, do what you can sure. do and work with your employees and listen to your employees and try to do those things that add value. Well, you've given them a great game plan right there and a roadmap. And a Dick's Burger sounds pretty darn good right now, I got to admit. The drive in president, Jasmine Donovan. Thanks for the time, Jasmine. Thank you. A pastor sending a powerful message about gun violence by spending 100 cold days on a Chicago rooftop in the wintertime. He'll join us. On that rooftop next, we're gonna ask him about the latest high profile shooting involving police and someone with a gun. So that was the dramatic body cam video released by the Minneapolis Police Department showing the moments leading up to the death of Amir Locke. Police were carrying out a no-knock search warrant when they entered the apartment. Locke was asleep and then emerged from under a blanket on the couch. He did, as you can see here, have a gun in his hand, a gun he legally owned. That's when police shot and killed the 22-year-old. Minneapolis police say the gun Locke was holding was loaded and pointed in the direction of officers, but also now acknowledge Locke was not named on the original warrant and was not a target of the investigation. And we do have some breaking news as well. We just learned that Minneapolis Mayor Jacob Fry has announced an immediate moratorium on no-knock warrants. Joining me now for more on the CEO of Project Hood, which aims to end gun violence in our communities, Pastor Corey Brooks is with us now, spending 100 nights on a Chicago rooftop in the middle of winter to help raise awareness and end gun violence in his community. Let's start with this shooting, if we could, Pastor, because when I heard about this, I thought about Breonna Taylor. There are a lot of similarities here. You hear about this case, what do you think? You know, it's very unfortunate um, that, that what happened. Uh, the police are doing the best they can do. They were issuing a warrant on a, a person that they thought was there, and uh, unfortunately, it was not the right individual, it appears to be. Uh, these are the type of situations that we have uh, here in Chicago. And while we're trying to make sure uh, that we have uh, Project Hood intervene in situations like this so that police officers won't even need to uh, have to issue house warrants. We, we really are working hard to change the lives of young people. Uh, but I, I really must say that uh, my heart goes out to the family and to those police officers who had to make a split, se a split second decision. How would Project Hood have intervened on this, Pastor? Well, our goal is to intervene in the lives of young people so that they don't end up in criminal activity. Uh, we're working very, very hard every day to make sure that we change an environment that is uh, criminally, uh, there, there's a lot of criminals at, at doing what they do. And so we have to intervene in their lives and we have to make sure that we give them alternatives uh, and options uh, to make sure that they don't go in that direction so that these type of warrants won't even be needed. Right, well, would, would you help police connect with these suspects they want so they don't have to you know, go in in the middle of the night? Well, our goal is to make sure that the police officers won't even need these type of services. We want to get them before they have to knock on the door or have to issue a search warrant for an individual. We want to get individuals off the streets and out of criminal activity, help them to transition their lives. That's the reason why we offer all kinds of opportunities, whether it be mentoring service, trauma counseling, violence prevention, or our, our construction services to make sure that we get those type of individuals uh, headed in a different direction. Because if we don't, um, these type of situations are, are bound to happen. Right. How critical, Pastor, do you think is the issue of trust between the community and the police? You know, trust is a big thing. Um, there's, there's so much going on in our world today, uh, especially in places like Chicago and other places where uh, there's a, 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 a big influence of police, and we have to work very hard to make sure that the community and the police work together to make sure that we make things better for everyone. But I will say this, uh, and never should we talk about or defund the police. They have a very difficult job. Uh, it's a job that, that we need. Uh, they're here to protect and serve, uh, but we have to work very hard to make sure that they're able to do their job so that they can protect and serve our community. But Trust is a big issue, and it, it, it works on both sides that uh, we need to put in the work to make it make it happen. Right. 100 days on a rooftop in the middle of the winter in Chicago. 
to try to bring about change? What's one thing you think the city of Chicago could do to change it? Well, one thing the city of Chicago could do is to make sure that we uh, give school choice. I know that may seem a far fetch for a lot of people and you may be trying to figure out what does that have to do with crime? But when these young children don't have an opportunity to be educated and they end up having to go to failing schools where they have 6% and 4% proficiency in math reading, then they end up dropping out of school and becoming criminals. Yeah. We have to do a better job at, at, on our school system, our educational system, and getting these young children um, the best education possible so that they don't end up in a life of crime. That's one thing um, that we could do here in Chicago. Well, I applaud your efforts and uh, your, your hearty willingness to stay on a roof at 100 days in Chicago, and we appreciate the time. Pastor Corey Brooks, good luck to you, CEO of Project Absolutely. Good. Thank you so much. Right. I appreciate it. Yeah, good to see you. On Balance with Cleveland Bitter starts at the top of the hour now. One of the presidential candidates. At one point, he said he thought he was going to. Remember, yeah. everybody was in love with this guy, and my, how he has fallen. You're talking about Michael Avenatti, who's yeah. now uh, been convicted on a second round of charges, this time for embezzling money from Stormy Daniels, his one-time client. In all of this, the people I feel the worst for is CNN. They have had a rough week. Okay, you think about uh, a couple of years ago, Jeff Zucker was the president of CNN. He was the media elite. He was the darling of the liberal intelligentsia taking on Donald Trump. He had Michael Avenatti as a guest every night on any one of his programs. Avenatti was going to go ahead and take over one of his programs if he didn't run for president. And now you think about where they are today. This week, Zucker fired for a sex scandal and Avenatti going to jail. Well, it's a cautionary tale, and it's really the fall for Avenatti. In addition to what we're talking about with uh, with Stormy Daniels was his conviction before that for uh, right. embezzling for money from Nike. Well, not for embezzling, for shaking him down. And for well, extorting, I'm sorry, you're extorting, right. Extorting Nike. And uh, yeah, it also goes though, and to speaks to the responsibility you and I have, of who we put on the shows every night and who we sort of raise up to these levels because CNN raising Avenatti up is what allowed him to do this. All right. On Balance starts at the top of the hour. Leland, thanks. See you then. Wait, no, there's a dog in the car. Dog in the car? There's a dog in the car. Rushes, a deputy rushes to break a trapped dog out of a burning vehicle. Next, more of that stunning body cam video and the touching thanks to the four-legged friend. That's our American Snapshot Ahead. We mentioned yesterday how it was a rough ride for Facebook investors with the stop, stock dropping more than 25%. For every 100 shares of Facebook you owned, you lost 8,500 bucks. Ouch. So, so as for Facebook or Meta CEO Mark Zuckerberg, the loss came to $29 billion. On the flip side, Amazon founder Jeff Bezos made $20 billion after the company's earnings call. Speaking of Bezos, the world's second richest person, he recently ordered the world's largest yacht from Dutch company Ocean Co. The only problem, in order to get the super yacht out to sea, the city of Rotterdam would have to dismantle a 95-year-old bridge. As of yesterday, more than 600 people on Facebook said they would attend an event titled Throwing Eggs at Super Yacht Jeff Bezos. Dismantling the bridge, known by locals as De Hef, would be paid for by Ocean Co. and Bezos. Those plans now on hold. We'll see where it goes. Don't forget Amazon raising the price of Prime by nearly 16%. Now this. Wait, no, there's a dog in the car. Dog in the car? There's a dog in the car. Oh, my God. Where's it at? So precious moments are ticking away there as a Colorado deputy rushed in to break into a burning SUV where a dog was trapped inside. You can hear the panic in the owner's voice there. He obviously couldn't get in. Then Deputy Michael Gregorek began busting the vehicle's windows out looking for the animal. And amid the plumes of smoke, the dog finally spotted, obviously distressed. And after a moment of struggling to get the log dar dog, large dog out, Gregorick was able to do it. Wow. As the smoke overtakes him. Here's more. <laughs> my only child is my dog, so I would have done, you know, the same thing, whether it be baby, human, dog, cat. You know, life is a life, and you kind of treat it as such in a situation like that. Man, that is great to see. And uh, the canine was very grateful, by the way, as you can see there with uh, lots of puppy kisses. That's our American Snapshot, and that's our time. Have a good night and a great weekend on Balance. Next, thank you for watching. Click the red subscribe button below so you can get more of News Nation's fact-driven, unbiased coverage.